Can everybody hear me? Okay. Warm well, welcome from my side into the afternoon session, and I'm very really happy that Shady Wright is here today to give us some ideas about his results of various hard problem modalities. So thank you very much, Shady, for being here. Um, uh, thanks for the Schwent family for uh, having me over here, and thank you for coming. I uh, will try to make it uh, to make the best of your time. Um, so uh, the topic of uh, my talk would be the hyperopic results using various modalities, uh, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. So in, in targeting hyperopia, I'm sorry, can, can you all hear me well? Okay, all right. So in targeting hyperopia, uh, we have several modalities. No matter what excitement laser you're using, um, it can be mechanical LASIK, it can be phantom LASIK, it can be PRK. You, you can hear me? Is it better now? Okay. So is it is it okay? All right. So it can be mechanical LASIK, phantom LASIK, PRK, or uh, PRK over LASIK. Um, treating hyperopia has its own uh, uh, set of cons. First is accommodation. We always have to account for the late regression that it's not actually a, a, a change in accommodation, and that by itself can affect the way we're thinking about the results. Partial monovision, most of us as a clinician have a tendency to overcorrect one or both eyes, and that's to kind of create partial monovision. Interestingly, if we don't account for that, we're going to end up with a falsely better result than what they are uh, 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 truly. And then three, nomogram adjustment, even though at least for the Schwinda models, we don't factor in a nomogram adjustment for myopes, but for hyperopes due to delayed uh, regression for many reasons, we're going to discuss in a minute, most of us do have some form of nomogram adjustment. And again, we need to account for the nomogram adjustment if we need to understand how the laser is working. Because if my nomogram adjustment is different than your nomogram adjustment, I'm not going to be able to understand if the laser is actually doing well and if we're feeling well in our ablation. And finally, the angle alpha and the angle kappa, we know that hyperopes have a large angle and we know that it is vital that we treat actually on the vertex instead of the treating on the pupil. And that's another uh, confounding variable. And that's why the concept of the SEDT, which is spherical equivalent deviation from target. And that's vital as opposed to the regular spherical equivalence. Now, what is SEDT? So if you look at the typical uh, a, a typical ablation um, printout, and if you see here, you have a target. This is the target you're going to use, and I encourage all of you to try to stick with the discipline to always put uh, over here the manifest or the cycloplegic refraction, and over here your target, because many of us might just lump it together, and instead of treating 4.5, you get just one put that value over here. And I think this is bad for nomogram evaluation and if you want to evaluate your results. So we need to really have a discipline to keep that, whether it's cyclopegic or, or manifest, but keep that the, the refraction of the patient and put this as a target, whatever you want to achieve. This way later, whatever uh, software you're using, whether data graph or whatever you have, you can isolate those two. And in here, let's say if you, the target is minus one, and if the final result is a spherical equivalent at six months of Plano, which is ideally a great result, Plano, but actually my target was minus one. So the spherical equivalent deviation from target is actually the actual spherical equivalent minus the target. And in that scenario, it's zero minus minus one is plus one. This means that my laser undercorrected by one diopter, and that's not good. Uh, but this is important because what the SEDT does is that it offsets two problems. The first problem is actually varying monovision uh, correction. I might correct three quarter for that eye, 1.25 for the other eye. It takes that as a confounding factor and it isolates monovision correction. And that's always a problem in treating uh, hyperopes as opposed to young myopes. And that's always a caveat. When you look at a study, you want to know exactly if they use SEDT. The second problem is it accounts for varying nomogram adjustment. We usually don't use, usually don't use nomogram adjustment for myopes on twins. But for hyperopes, every one of us have its own minimal nomogram adjustment. And by using the SEDT, it takes this out and it will tell us what the laser actually did. This way we can recalculate the nomogram adjustment based on our new results. And that's what we use in our, our uh, studies. So the first modality, let's compare mechanical LASIK versus femtolasic and hyperopic treatment. Now, li the literature is very obvious in terms of myopic treatment. Both actually are very similar. 
I mean, put aside the potential complication, mechanical and uh, femtolasic in many studies have shown equivocal results and almost all, I would say, averaging them out, they're always the same. We haven't seen any major advantage results-wise for femto versus mechanical. Now, how about hyperopia? Is that okay? Is it still fine? Or? Okay. Okay. Um, is it still okay now? Okay, so how about hyperopia? If you look, uh, this is a study that we published in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, and then basically we evaluated retrospectively 53 eyes with 72 eyes, all matched for spherical equivalence, uh, astigmatism, and uh, manifest sacroplegic refraction and all. And then uh, uh, what we notice again, I mean, look at the, the manifest refraction, look at this uh, uh, sacroplegic refraction, we made sure that our included patients did not have more than half of adaptive change differences between the two. Um, and as you see here, um, so basically, if you look at um, the spherical equivalence deviation from target, over time, you notice that at one month, both modalities, whether mechanical and femto, were dead on. Uh, sorry, at one week, they were dead on. Okay? And then if you notice, with the follow-through, we have a slight regression for both. And then almost the slope is equal for both later, but the regression with mechanical is more. And then you see that uh, ultimately the spherical equivalent deviation from target is 0.7 for mechanical versus 0.28 for or 0.3 for the, uh, the femtolasic. So both regress, the mechanical regress more. Now, if we think that way, we might say, okay, the nomogram adjustment is easy. I would use 0.3 for femto and 0.7 diopter for mechanical. But it's not as simple as we think, because if we look at the attempted versus um, achieved uh, graph, we see that we have more scatter for the mechanical. And of course, the blue are the mechanical, the yellow is the femto. We see more of the undercorrected. This is the undercorrected area. We see more blue on the undercorrected than we do see on the tighter curve. Of course, as you see here, the femtolasic have a much tighter curve than we see with the mechanical LASIK, which means if you want to try to account for the spherical equivalent deviation from target, it's much easier to build a nomogram for femtolasic than it is for mechanical LASIK, because the tighter the fit, the better the nomogram will have uh, uh, of a use. Now, if you, if you plot the spherical equivalent deviation from target on the y-axis with the attempted correction, and this is a typical nomogram technology to, to look at uh, what happens, we see that there is a linear curve for the femtolasic, not a high slope, a mild slope, whereby maybe I would add 0.25 diopters at 2 diopters, 0.37 at 4, and maybe 0.5 at 6 diopters to eliminate the latent regression, at least when we look at 6 month values. Now, if you look at uh, the mechanical, it's all over the place. The blue are all over the place, and actually, it's a reverse slope. So I'm not sure how this is accurate, but it's a 0.75 diopter. The fit is not really good. And that, by the way, was, uh, I mean, that was done many years ago, but that was, for us, a clear seal for not using at all mechanical, let alone all the potential complications, but not using mechanical LASIK in, um, uh, in hyperopia. Again, look at uh, the predictability, which is the spherical equivalent division of target at every bracket of uh, diopters. And we see, of course, a more hyperopic shift. 9 to 10% is in femto versus 28% in, in, uh, in mechanical when you look at diopter, one diopters and above. And that was clinically significant. Now, how about femtolasic and PRK? Now, this is a study that we did and evaluated all of our hyperopic PRK and femtolasic matched uh, for everything and then evaluated at one year at least and at three years, uh, so one year and three years, so they have a long-term uh, follow-up. And we see again, now um, we see always a dip for PRK, typical dip we're, we're, we're used to for the first uh, month and it continues all the way to six months, something we see it's, uh, very commonly. And then of course it's more stable for LASIK, but if you notice that um, at one year, PRK has a much uh, 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 less undercorrection than LASIK. If you take it in absolute term, it was 0.05 as opposed to 0.25. At one year, it was actually 0.20. Uh, at three years, it was 0.26 versus 0.39. So at first, we would say yes, PRK has less undercorrection. So let alone regression, because this is you know regression, right? But this is we know that this is epithelial most likely, so this is 
less under correction than LASIK. However, if you look at uh, the fit, the fit of both lasers, and again, the red is FEMTO and the blue is, is PRK, we see that the fit of the FEMTO is a little bit better than the fit of the PRK. The PRK is all over the place, a little bit of over, a little bit of under. The FEMTO is a little bit of under, but it's the, 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 the tighter fit is right there, okay, as opposed to uh, PRK. Again, if you look at predictability, which is spherical equivalent deviation from target, bracketed over all the diopters, you see that the PRK has a much wider range, either on the undercorrected side, uh, overcorrected side, or undercorrected side. The Pantolistic is more a little bit on, on the undercorrected side, but I can correct that with a nomogram. With the PRK, it's a little bit larger, so the nomogram will be less predictable than with the femto. Nothing is major, but we're trying here to split hairs and see what is best for the patient whenever possible, of course. With astigmatism, if you look at femto, most of the astigmatism really lies in the half diopter uh, area, whereas for mechanical, we have, uh, well, sorry, whether for PRK, 57% are within half diopters. And then we see every now and then, especially at, at three years, some of the patients developing 1 to 1.5 diopters, very few at uh, uh, more than 1.5 diopters correction. Now, this is a case that we did not include in our study because it was uh, filtered out by the matching process because the, the patient did not fit in the criteria. But it's an interesting case. It's not common, but I see that every now and then, and I'm going to show them to you. Maybe you do have something similar. Now, this is a patient who had um, hyperopic PRK. The patient had amblyopia in the other eye. We did not have the chance to do any uh, lens-based surgery. We could not do a, a, a femto uh, on him. So we did the PRK. And as you see here, he started with a one eye with a plus 5.5 minus 1.5. So polygraphy looked pretty good. And the SIMK 42.7 with a 2.16 diopter of astigmatism. At six months, the manifest refraction with plus 4.25 diopter, the cylinder was pretty much nothing. The topography looked pretty centered and steep. At uh, two years, you see that there is a little bit of regression there, a little bit of cylinder, but not much. But what happens when the patient comes back four years later? You have a very nice bow tie over there, right? A very nice vertical bow tie, and the refraction now is plus 4 minus 4.5 axis uh, 180. Something very weird. Well, when you looked at um, the um, when you looked at the lamp, the patient developed a nasal peripheral haze. Now, when we asked the patient, the patient used to be in Lebanon, and he moved to work in Saudi, and then that was many years later. Uh, and we all know, by the way, and there are many studies showing that the way the light concentrates, like in pterygium, is nasal. And interestingly, we did not have anything temporal. It's just the nasal flattening the cornea, the cornea on the horizontal meridian, and steepening the cornea on the vertical meridian. And then a perfect patient getting a great result till now developed a perfect vertical bow tie. Now, we don't know whether some of the peripheral haze we see in, uh, in PRK that can be delayed, probably from uh, UV light exposure, might, have, might account for this small astigmatism that we're noticing delayed. But we tell our patients, we still do PRK over hyperopia, but we tell our patients really to uh, uh, be very careful about sunlight and UV uh, light. Now finally, hyperopic ablation over LASIK. How about doing PRK over LASIK flap? So uh, definitely we have two options in hyperopic uh, retreatments. We can do a flap lift or we can do a PRK over a flap. Now, the literature shows us PRK over LASIK for myopes. We don't have any data about hyperopic PRK over uh, LASIK flap. So what is the problem of relifting a flap? There's no problem, but there are a couple of issues we have to deal with. One, in hyperopia, we have a higher risk for epithelial ingrowth. Two, most of the regression, if ever happened, is going to happen later than one or two years. Now, we all know, many studies show that after two years, the risk of having epithelial ingrowth is exponential, let alone in older patients and hyperopic patients. And finally, one of the reasons we ended up with a, probably an undercorrection regression, maybe that the flap was not on the, on the perfect size, or maybe it was a bit decentered. So here, when we relift, we are bound to, uh, to with the same limitations that, ha that had us in the first place. Now, those are issues that are not, uh, I mean, deal breakers, but they're issues that we're dealing with. That's why we thought about, what about treating PRK over LASIK? When you see something like that, I mean, uh, it might, you might really think twice about having to treat, to retreat hyperopic patient with flap relift. So, um, 
again, we, uh, we designed a study where we, we evaluated our patients, 25 eyes of 25 patients, having at least one year of follow-up and an average follow-up of three years. And we looked at all uh, the data. Of course, 1.73 diopters was the, the average refraction, but we attempted much more because, again, we like monovision. If it's the non-dominant eye, we like to treat more, so we have 2.73 diopters of treatment. Again, as expected, we have a myopic shift. You know, bear in mind that we treated 2.75, but this is 1.75 as fear, spherical equivalence, but this is spherical equivalence deviation from target. And again, we shoot myopia first. Typically, as you saw before in the previous slide, at about one year, we're almost uh, right on the zero, uh, about six months, we are almost at the zero. At about one year, we are 0 0.2, and uh, at about three years, as an average, we're about 0 0.4. Pretty good results for me. This is without nomogram adjustment, without monovision adjustment. So this is the SEDT. Uh, I'm going to let the question to the end. I'm sorry to be. Um, so this is the SEDT again. So that can be factored in with a nomogram adjustment. And again, if you look at the uncorrected, this is visual acuity. 83 to 92 percent at, at three years were actually 2025 or better. Again, not a bad results at all. Uh, the fit and the attempted and achieved was good. Not perfect was pretty good without much outliers. And again, interestingly enough with the stigmatism, and that's very interesting, maybe because the correction was low, we had better than what we have with hypropic PRK in general. We have 79% of the patients within half of a doctor of astigmatism at three years, and that's pretty good. Um, again, we, we saw a couple of scars and haze that was peripheral, and did, I mean, uh, it was linked with some astigmatism, but it did not affect us much. So the conclusion overall, is that in hypropic ablation, uh, femtolasic wins over mechanical hands down. Femtolasic is more predictable than PRK in terms of spherical equivalent and cylinder. Not by a whole lot, but overall is more predictable. However, PRK is, has less undercorrection than femtolasic even at three years. And then finally, PRK is safe and effective to treat and enhance uh, uh, patients with hypropic uh, undercorrection or regression after LASIK. Uh, finally, uh, we need to remember a few things. Number one is to treat the vertex, not the pupil. We don't have, we should not over in the cornea. Uh, we have to account for accommodation, something very important. And finally, whatever we do, we have to let our patient know that whatever we do, the fit will never be like the one we have in my robes. This is the fit of my robes, and look at the scale. This is a minus 10 scale. This is a plus 5 scale. It's half, and as you can see, not just with the, with the Schwind, which I consider the best platform for high probes, but for all lasers, nobody can get that fit for the high probes. This is a good fit, but this is a perfect fit. And that's why, I mean, we owe it to ourselves to keep pushing. Schwind has done amazing results with Excimer. I mean, over the past 10 years, I think they were the only platform that pushed from TransPRK to Smart Pulse to uh, corneal waveform guided to asymmetric uh, centration and to so many an excitement where most companies have kind of diverged to something else. So this is, I think, the holy grail. This is the frontier where we can really, instead of shying away directly to lens-based surgeries, which are an option, but still we have to try to improve that, whether ablation zone, whether other things. So basically, um, as I said, um, if we have to think anyway, why don't we think big? Thank you. Thank you very much, Shady, for this excellent findings. So, here is the first question. Uh, what is your micro-nursing protocol for... What is your micro-nursing protocol for hyperopic uh, PRK? And what, now, what is your the most hyperopic you will treat with the PRK? We use 45 seconds for any PRK, and if it's a high PRK, we go all the way to one minute, okay? Uh, we, we use 45 seconds for anything from plus two, plus one, whatever, and we use for high correction, like plus four and above, we use one full minute, okay? And uh, uh, the maximum, actually, it is plus six. It all depends on the cornea to start with, and, you know, we have to talk to the patient about everything, but the plus six have very flat corneas. So if we start with 40, we, you, you know, we can go to, to, to six doctors. If, if you start with 43, 44, that's definitely not a good option. But if the cornea is flat and everything looks good and the patient has a good ear form, why not? If the cornea is flat and if the patient knows it. We have good result by the way, plus six. You'll be amazed. Any other question? 
regarding the centration on the vertex, uh, are we talking about uh, visual access? Can you uh, tell us how to do it exactly on the machine with the offset? Uh, I guess we have the, the, uh, the series, right? Okay, so we have the pyramids and we have the, the scout. And basically everything is taken right there. So now with the, with the software, we don't have to do anything. It's there. If you want to decenter, you can decenter. What we do usually with PRK, we don't decenter because with the asymmetric ablation, with the asymmetric offset, it's pretty good. So we don't decenter. We're right on. The laser will automatically show it. Once you transfer it, it will show the value. So we will leave it as on. The only reason I do decenter sometimes is with femtolasic because sometimes the, the flap, we were not sure with a big ablation that we can get an inadequate size flap to be on the safe side. I do some, uh, I will decrease it a little bit. But not that I don't trust the system. I, I think it's great. The, descent, the, the asymmetrical ablation of Schwinn is really good. There's a great paper in JRS for Sam where they explain, uh, explain it, everything and never had any problem with directly treating on the vertex. You know, my initial problem with glare and halo is because of the pupil, but with the asymmetric uh, offset, it's really good. And, and I would go all the way to the vertex unless I can't, like in, in cases of uh, femtolasic with a large ablation zone. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to question one of the first choice lessons for relaxing the therapeutic patients. Which choice? And another thing, what do you think about the choice of PRT in the therapeutic patients? Um, uh, my first choice would be femtolasic with, uh, with hyperopic PRK, but I do offer PRK because not all patients are, are uh, a candidate for femtolasic. So if I see any question mark on topography or other things <clears throat> about dryness and everything, as you saw from the results, the PRK are actually still doing very well. So I would still go for PRK, but my first choice would be femtolasic. Now, as far as sense PRK, this is excellent. And before my, you know, I... Uh, 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 I wanted to explore the five modalities, which is trans-PRK, not only high or prk Interestingly enough, when I started trans-PRK, the results were good, but I wasn't sure about the haze I was getting at the periphery. And then at the time, I decided to stop and continue with PRK. And because I don't do a lot of hypropic PRK now that I, you know, with, with the data and I go move for femto, I decided to stick with alcohol PRK. Now, I see uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Mugadim and other, uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Hafezi, they have... Or I guess pretty good results, but I would like to see the data yet. So I'm sure if I see the data, I might convert. But till now, I'm pretty much happy with alcohol PRK. So uh, only in, in, in hypropia. Of course, with myopia, I do with trans PRK all the time. And until the, uh, the increase the optical zone uh, of the laser recently, I was doing actually splitting my, my treatment in two, two treatments in mode of doing like a six point eight. 7.5 mm for PRK to lessen the Russian weight in the periphery. Have you any experience with that? I never did that, so I, I never did that. I can't, I can't uh, comment. Any other question? Uh, okay, and thank you very much, David. Thank you for, for everybody for coming. Thank you.